All right, so my preaching this afternoon is, is just a doctrinal issue uh, in general. It's just, just uh, teaching. We're going to go through Old Testament and New Testament on the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. And talk of my sermon is the Holy Spirit upon you. And even just in the prayer that Brother Kevin said right before we started, you know, we pray that, that God will, will fill pastor with your spirit, with your Holy Spirit, right, and lead him. And, you know, this is something that you probably hear regularly in prayers and in and, and speaking in church and stuff. But, um, you know, maybe you haven't thought about it very much, but God, God's relationship with us, we, we always want to be spiritually minded and be thinking about God because God is capable of giving us of his spirit to endue us with power and to do things that he wants us to do to help us, to, to give us the abilities that we don't naturally have, that we don't normally have. And this is different than what happens when a person gets saved. So I'm going to discuss a little bit later in the sermon, there's a difference between the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that every single New Testament believer has when they get saved. This is a new thing that was added in the New Testament. However, God pouring out his spirit or filling people with his spirit or having his spirit rest upon and come upon people has been happening throughout all of history, Old Testament and New Testament. So we're going to go through many examples in Scripture of people having the Spirit come upon them, and I want you just to take notice, one, on what happens when people are filled with the Spirit. We can see the results of God putting His Spirit on people, so what you can expect to see. Because here's the thing, when, when we're dealing with spirits or the Holy Spirit, that leaves a lot of room for error and false doctrine because it's one of those things where it's like, well, you can't see it. I can't see the spirit. So people come up with all kinds of crazy ideas, especially in like the Pentecostal movement and just in, in other fringe Christian denominations that are just going to just make up stuff and just call a bunch of craziness the Holy Spirit, which is obviously not the Holy Spirit of God. But when we look, go to the Bible and we just look at Scripture, we're going to see these examples and see, okay, this is what it means to be filled with the Spirit. This is what's going to happen. And this is what we should be seeking and praying to God for in understanding that God can pour out His Spirit upon you. He could also take His Spirit away from you. I'm not, and again, not talking about the indwelling. It doesn't mean you lose your salvation. And this is going to become evident later on. I've got examples in here that just clearly will show you that when God's spirit departs from people, it doesn't mean they're unsaved. And when his spirit comes upon people, it doesn't mean, well, that's the moment they get saved. Okay, there's, there's a huge difference there. But I've compiled a whole list of a lot of people that have the spirit of God coming upon them. And, and we get to see what happens as a result. So just kind of pay attention. I may not mention every single detail. Just, just try to stay. I know it's late. We've, we've been out in the heat and doing soul winning and everything. So just try to, try to perk up a little bit, sit up straight, pay attention. Uh, I, I'm hoping it's not going to be too dry for you, but, but understanding this, this doctrine is very important. It's something we need to be mindful of. And, you know, I was talking this morning about, about freedom and being free in Christ. Well, along with this freedom comes with, you know, seeking the, the, the Spirit of God. We'll see how that ties in a little bit later. We're going to have a connection with this morning's sermon, but let's Look down in Numbers chapter 11. This is Moses, okay? Moses has the Spirit of God upon him. And, and I'll tell you this much. Moses was a meek man. He was a humble man. He was not the type of person that just wanted to be the center of attention. But he was the center of attention. He was the one that God used to lead the children of Israel. He was the person who was judging all of Israel after he got, you know, God had used him to bring them out of Egypt and everything else, he ended up being placed in a position where everybody's eyes were on him and that he was at the top of decision-making for a whole group of people. And it wasn't because he sought that out, but it was because God wanted to use him because he knew, God knew, that God would get the glory by using a man like Moses and that Moses was going to do the job well because he was humble and meek. And he was going to do what God t told him to do and had for him to do, okay? And this is where we should be today. And you need to understand, don't limit yourself 
in your capacity of being used by God, because if God wants to use you for some reason, he will give you what you need to do the job. Guaranteed. And I, and I go over this many times because I, think, I feel like I'm a very good example of what God could do, not because I think I'm so great right now, but the fact that I could stand up here and preach without having horrible stomach pains and being able to even think and talk right now has nothing to do with any natural abilities that I've ever had, ever. The only way it's even been possible, and it's not even from experience, it's from God giving me the ability that I need to do this job, which is why, as a pastor, I need to be really making sure that I could walk in the Spirit and that God's Spirit could be upon me because if I was left up here by myself without God to help, I wouldn't want to see or hear what I'd have to say because <laughs> it wouldn't be very good at all. So anything that you get out of, out of me preaching, it's not coming from me and from my intellect and from how, how good speaking I am. That's not it at all. If you're receiving truth and you're receiving knowledge and getting better understanding it's from the holy spirit giving me what i need to do the job that god has put me in to do and <laughs> what i have is is still little compared to what god has used other people to do and he's looking for people who have the right heart and the right attitude and are willing to yield themselves to be able to use and he will supply whatever it is that you need. He wanted to use Moses to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. Moses didn't have the power to part the Red Sea, right? <laughs> Obviously, he needed the power of God. I mean, there's so many things, and we see these examples over and over and over again, whether it be on a grand scale, like it was with Moses, or whether it even be on a much smaller scale, God still provides, and he does so through his spirit, through, through pouring out of his spirit on people. Moses here in this chapter, Moses is dealing with this people who are, who are a bunch of complainers, who are just constantly having problems and complaining and murmuring. And we see this in Numbers chapter 11, and Moses is just like, I mean, there's only so much a person could take. And he's saying, God, I can't take this anymore. So God devised a plan to where he's going to say, okay, Moses, I, you're, you're right, I'm going to help distribute this load so it's not all on your shoulders, so, so that you're going to have some help. And he has, he has Moses choose out 70 people. I mean, think about that. I mean, I, we were just talking about this uh, before, sir. I was talking about my job and, and how, you know, the workload. And I've got a couple people that work for me now. And, and when I started, there was nobody there. And then I started. And, then, and you, get, you get people, and they, and they help unload the work. I mean, even in church, you know, I started from doing everything, planning all the soul winning, doing the same, you know, preparing the songs, doing all, you know, doing everything. So now there's other people helping. That helps distribute the load. There's, you know, it, it, and it makes you, allows you to do a lot more stuff, ultimately. Moses is the same way. I mean, he's bearing this load that ends up being distributed among 70 other people. I mean, that's a lot of people. The only thing I've ever dealt with, I've got like a few people helping. It's like, oh, man, that's great. I don't even have work for 70 people to do, you know, so he was carrying a huge load. But look at what the Bible says that God does to prepare these 70 people that Moses is choosing out to help him. Now, first of all, too, just, just understand this. These people are being chosen by Moses based on their character already, based on the type of person, based on, on how humble they are, how, you know, the, 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 the way that they present themselves, the way that they live, how godly they are, right? And they don't know that this, this moment is coming up where they're going to be chosen to do a greater job or a greater work or to serve more but they've just been doing the best that they can. And this is where you need to understand, you know, where I said don't limit yourself. There may come a time where there's a need and God wants to use you to be put into a different position. So make sure that you're ready to be used, that you're someone that, that is going to want to be selected. Right? You don't want to be like when, when kids are picking teams for basketball or something, be like the last guy that nobody wants. And our team, you know, like the, these 70 people, these were the top 70 guys, or Moses thinking, if I could have anybody help me out, who can I rely on? Who's going to be faithful? Who's going to be dependable? Well, I want this person, this person, this person, this person, right? That's how you ought to be living your Christian life, is just thinking like, hey, if, if anything needs to be done, I want to be the guy that can be called on to get this job done. 
even if you don't have great plans of going off and being a missionary or being a pastor or doing some other you know, high profile job, if you will, in the church, just be someone that can be used of God in any capacity. And just be living that way so that you're ready when, when the time comes, you say, like, well, I don't think I could preach. I don't think I'd do this. Well, you know what? God could change that. I mean, Moses was so frightened of doing this, he was just begging God, like, God, can you just have, like, someone else? I mean, okay, God, but whoever you really want to have do this. And, and, and God gave him Aaron. But what we see, even after God gave Moses Aaron, did Moses really need Aaron? He thought he did, but did he really need him? No, because once God supplied his spirit to Moses, Moses was doing the talking anyways. When, when he gave him Aaron, he's like, okay, well, here, you'll be to, to Aaron like I am to you. You'll be like God to Aaron, and you're going to speak and tell him what he needs to say, right? Just like I'm telling you what you need to say. But then when we read the Bible, we see Moses doing most of the talking anyways. I mean, he, he steps in and fills that role. So he was, he was uncertain and had some doubts, but they were unfounded and unwarranted because God would supply. Because he, didn't, he couldn't understand how can God change him enough to be able to speak and, and, and do what he needed him to do. But God did absolutely provide and give him what he needed to be able to do the job. So, so just remember that in general, just in your life, and don't sell yourself and definitely don't sell God short. I mean, yourself, yeah, if you're just left to yourself, you won't be able to do it. But understand that that's not how God works. He doesn't just leave you to yourself. He will pour out his spirit upon those he wants to use to fill his, his will. Let's look at verse number 16. So the Bible says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Gather unto me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be the elders of the people, and officers over them, and bring them unto the tabernacle of the congregation, that they may stand there with thee. And I will come down and talk with thee there, and I will take of the spirit which is upon thee and will put it upon them and they shall bear the burden of the people with thee that thou bear it not thyself alone. So my first point here too, and this is just pretty basic and elementary, but important for understanding. This is the Old Testament and God is, is giving of his spirit Moses, this isn't a New Testament thing. This is, this is an all-time thing where God's saying, okay, I've already given part of my spirit unto you, Moses, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to also now pour my spirit that, that's on you and give it to these other guys. So then they'll be equipped to be able to handle the job that you're doing so that they can help you do that same job. Jump down to verse number 24. The Bible says, And Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord and gathered the 70 men of the elders of the people and set them round about the tabernacle. And the Lord came down in a cloud and spake unto him and took of the spirit that was upon him and gave it unto the 70 elders. And it came to pass that when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied and did not see. So right away, and, and, and I'm going to point this out right now, but pay attention to this as we continue to go forward. The number one thing that you're going to see when God pours out his spirit on people is the, what do they do? They speak. They preach, they prophesy. Here the Bible says, the Spirit rests upon them, they prophesied and did not cease. They didn't stop. And we're seeing many examples of this, but the reason why I say that, I mean, think about, if you're just to take a step back and just think, without all the Bible knowledge and everything else, and just say, if, God, if I'm just communicating with God and God's going to pour his Spirit on me, just at a really high level, right? Just, just kind of forget about all the doctrines of the Bible, just, just think about, here I am, there's God. God's going to pour out his spirit on me. What's that going to do for me? What is that for? What is the purpose of God giving of his spirit? I mean, am I going to be able to just like be like Superman and fly around and do all this stuff? I mean, with God's spirit, I should be able to do that, right? I'm going to be like a mutant and have all these powers and, do, you know, like, but no. See, people come up with all kinds of things if you're just thinking in general about God and spirit. But every time, I, mean, I want you to notice this, we're going to go through a lot of examples. When God pours out his spirit, it's for one purpose. It's to be able to preach. It's to be able to prophesy. It's to be able to speak the word of the Lord the way that he wants to preach. And, he, and we ought to be coveting God to pour out his spirit on us so that we can preach. So he says here, the spirit rested upon them and they prophesied and did not cease. Verse 26 says, but there remained two of the men in the camp. The name of the one was Eldad, and the name of the other Medad, and the spirit rested upon them. 
and they were of them that were written, but went not out unto the tabernacle, and they prophesied in the camp. So here we see Moses chose 70 people. 68 of them actually show up to the tabernacle, like, okay, well, we're appointed, we're here, God pours out his spirit. But Moses had written down the names of 70 people and saying, these are the people that want to help me. They didn't show up, but you know what happened? God still poured out his spirit on those 70 that were chosen. And what happens then is, it says here, verse 27, there ran a young man and told Moses, said, Eldad and me, Dad, do prophesy in the camp. So he's like, tell, he's like, hey, these guys are prophesying in the camp. Right? They're not here, but they're out there prophesying. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of Moses, one of his young men answered and said, my Lord, Moses, forbid them. So Joshua is just getting all upset, like, hey, they should have been here. Why weren't they here? Tell them to stop preaching in the camp. They're supposed to be here with us, you know, receiving the, the, the spirit here and not doing their own thing or whatever, right? But look how Moses answered in verse number 29. And Moses said unto him, envious thou for my sake? Would God that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them? So he's saying, you know what would just be great, Joshua? If, if all the Lord's people were prophets and then that God's spirit was on everybody, how much more then would be done? But see, that's, that's not happening. But would God that it would happen, and I think the reason why it's not happening as much is because we do need to prepare our vessels so that we can be meat for the master's use. Moses was told to choose people because God wants people who are going to be faithful. He wants people who are going to be servants. He wants people who are going to be humble. He wants people that are going to serve. Not make it all about them, not be greedy of filthy lucre, not have all of these other flaws that are going to destroy the work. If God's going to take the time and pour out his spirit on someone, he says, you know what, I want these people to do a good job. I don't want them to bring my name down. I want them to exalt my name. So that's why you have, you know, in, in the New Testament, you have the qualifications of a pastor. And here we have Moses deciding and choosing, hey, look at the elders of the people. Look at the people who are well respected. Look at the people who have already been determined to be faithful and make them to be your helpers, to be your servants, to be your ministers. And then God's pouring out his spirit on them. But there's also this, this concept, and turn if you go to Judges chapter 3, of so what, they're not in our camp. If God's spirit's on them and they're preaching, then amen. Now they should have been there. They should have gone. I mean, that would have been right for them to do, but you know what, if God's going to pour out his spirit on people and they're going to preach, then Amen. How are they going to say anything bad if God's spirit is on them and they're preaching the word of God? <laughs> they're going to be preaching the truth. Judges chapter 3, and we're going to see this happen a lot in the book of Judges. Verse number 9, the Bible says, And when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer to the children of Israel, who delivered them, even Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. And the spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel and went out to war. And the Lord delivered Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand. And his hand prevailed against Cushan Rishathaim. And I don't know why that name had to be in there twice. Probably just to screw up people trying to read it. <laughs> just kidding. Look over to Judges chapter 6. Because the only other thing, the, the, the other main thing you're going to see, I, I mentioned what you're going to see very, very frequently is people preaching, right? People going out and speaking and preaching. That is number one. And number two is going to be people going out to war and fighting battles. When the, when, when the Spirit of God comes upon people, the Spirit of the Lord, it's preparing them for a battle. So we need the Lord to be upon us to preach, to prophesy, and we need the Lord to come upon us to help us in our time of need, like with a spiritual battle. Now, obviously, these are physical battles going on. We're dealing in spiritual battles, and that's the whole teaching here and understanding is that God's going to be there to be your defender and to be there to help you to uh, even just to know how to give you the knowledge and the wisdom on how to proceed. And, and I don't have every example, by the way, of this happening in Scripture. So don't worry, because there's a lot of them. And you can look up for yourself. And you can look up all the times that David consulted the Lord on what to do in his battles. And the Spirit, the, we're going to see where the, where the Bible says that the Spirit comes upon David and is just with him then you know, for, for an extended period of time. So then you could just go back and see all these other times where David's acting righteously, and you say, well, the Spirit's with him there anyways. Look at verse number, or chapter 6, verse number 33. This is Gideon. 
Bible says, Then all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the children of the east were gathered together and went over and pitched in the valley of Jezreel. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, and Abiezer was gathered after him. So the Spirit of, of the Lord coming upon Gideon, and when you know the story, you get a little bit more understanding as well. And for all these people, the Spirit of the Lord is going to provide boldness. Boldness to stand out. Boldness to, to step out in faith. Boldness to do something that might look crazy to some people. And Gideon gathering together a much smaller number and force against a much greater army might seem like a suicide squad or a death wish. But having God on your side and having that faith and then having God's spirit on you to help give you that boldness, help provide you the, the strength to keep going and say, no, this is right, we're going to do this, is needed for that job. But see, when your heart's right, and God's looking to use someone whose heart is right, then God will give you the extra spirit, the extra strength that you need to, make, to, to just keep moving forward. And it doesn't counter your will. That's why your spirit needs to be willing. Your flesh is weak, but your spirit needs to be willing. And when your spirit is willing, God can, can supply the lack of the spirit to, to, to keep you moving in the right direction and doing what's right because you want to. Uh, Judges chapter 11, verse number 29, we're going to see Jephthah here, another judge of Israel. And, and the Lord raises up these judges in many cases of people who do not have some great royal backgrounds, by the way. Jephthah was one. Jephthah was, was like a bastard child of a harlot. And someone who was outcast, who God ended up using to judge Israel. Gideon was, was another one who, um, not, not a bastard, but he was you know, someone that was very timid and meek and, and, and didn't, wouldn't be someone that you would necessarily look to as being some great military leader. And then all of a sudden, God turned him into that. The Spirit of God comes upon him, and then he's this great, mighty warrior. The sword of the Lord of, and of Gideon. You remember that, right? Then he gets real bold and goes out and fights these battles for the Lord and wins because God's with him. Because God pours out his spirit on him to help him get to the place where he needs to be. People who are not warriors, people who are not, you know, these, these trained just like Goliath, right? He was a warrior from his youth. I mean, he's, he's trained and he's this mighty man and he's this powerful. And this is what he was born to do and this is what he was trained to do and this is what his whole life was about. That's not who David was a shepherd boy. He wasn't some trained, hardened warrior that, that did nothing all day but train and fight and battle. He's this great gladiator. But it didn't matter. He didn't need to be because God gave him what he needed. God helped him win that battle. God's the one that was with him in order to defeat that giant. The glory and the credit goes unto God. David gives the glory and credit unto God. Of course it belongs unto God. Being able to sling a stone at his head and kill that giant? Absolutely. In one shot? pretty amazing but he was willing and he had faith and he knew that the Lord can save and the Lord can deliver and he was willing to step out in faith God poured out the spirit that he needed done the rest is history verse uh, 11 chapter 11 verse 29 of Judges the Bible says the spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah and he passed over Gilead and Manasseh and passed over Mizpe of Gilead and from Mizpeh of Gilead, he passed over unto the children of Ammon. So basically, the Spirit of the Lord comes on Jephthah, and then he goes out to battle. He goes out to fight this war. And of course, he makes a dumb vow, but, but basically he's going out, again, outnumbered against these forces. And he's, you know, God, if you'll help me, if you deliver these people in my hand, you know, I'll make the sacrifice unto you. And uh, should never have made that vow, but all he needed was the Spirit of the Lord already. He didn't need to make the vow. God was there for him to supply his need even though he himself didn't fully understand that, just like Moses didn't fully understand it. God pours out his spirit, you may not fully understand it. The Pentecostals make you think, oh, when God pours out his spirit, you're going to be rolling around and you're going to be laughing and whatever, all the slain in the spirit nonsense stuff when you're like being possessed with the devil. It's not like that. It's not like that. And I, I think I've related this story to you before, but 
you know, when, when I cha transitioned from being, from being a church member, from preaching, from even teaching a preaching class, from doing all these different things, supporting the church, to actually being a pastor of a church, there was a transition that happened in my preaching, in my preparation, in my understanding, in all of that, that I have no explanation for other than God just gave me what I needed then to do the next job. When I was doing other preaching, when I was preaching in a nursing home, when I was doing filling in, God gave me what I needed for that. But then when I stepped up to a bigger role and, and, and having more responsibility and, and doing more things, then God provided that as well. It's there. I mean, I'm just trying to relate the best I can because this is what I know. I mean, this is what I know for a fact from my own life. But you don't need my examples. We've got the scripture. We see this with these men over and over and over again. And I know from what I see is I didn't know and have some special feeling, oh, the Spirit's with me. But I knew that God was using me to do more things. I could see it. It was evident in, in, in the results. Not before, after is when you realize, wow, God has really been in this. I mean, how many times have you went out soul winning and then you talk to people and then it's like, oh man, I've just been praying, you know, and, you, and you see these amazing things happening, that it's like, there's no way it was a coincidence, but you didn't know that before you went out, other than just having that faith of knowing that God's using you, but, like, you didn't know you are going to talk to someone who was just praying last night and wants to know the truth, and what, you know, and like, ends up getting saved or whatever, but God knows that, but it's easy then to look back and be like, yeah, God, I mean, God totally led me to this door, I mean, even the guy I talked to today, I feel like God led me to that door, he said, man, I needed this today, I needed to hear this, this is so important. Thank you so much. You know, th this was extremely important for me to know today. And the only reason I went down to that side of the building instead of over here is because if someone was sitting outside on the bench or on the, on the stairs, and I was going to go talk to them because there's somebody out and open. But that person ended up being on the phone. So <laughs> they, didn't, they were involved in their conversation, so it's like, okay, well, I'm not going to talk. So I might as well knock on this door then. And it was that person's door. I thought I was going to go talk to that one person. I ended up talking to someone else who's saying, this is extremely important for me. I'm so thankful that you came to my door today. You see that on the back end, though. And then it's like, wow, yeah, it's amazing. God was leading. And God's providing what you need at that time. All the more important to be spiritually minded every day of your life not just on Sunday, not just on Wednesday, every day. Because you never know when God might want to use you for his will, for his glory. And we, and we ought to be here for that. We're, we're supposed to be living sacrifices, ready and meet for the master's use. Turn to Judges chapter 14. Judges chapter 14. We're going to see in Judges 14 and 15 about uh, Samson, the Spirit of the Lord coming upon Samson. And again, Samson wasn't the most ideal role model for a Christian, but he definitely was a believer in the Lord. I mean, there was no doubt about that. And God had a purpose and a use for him as well, and God gave him what he needed to do the job that God wanted him to do, which is different than some of the jobs that God has had other people to do. In a sense, it's different. The, the, the way that it came about being is different, but ultimately it was still deliverance and freedom. All of these people are being used as deliverers and to bring freedom to the people, to God's people. That's what the judges were there for. He's raising up deliverers because they're going into bondage and he's raising up deliverers to free the people. And every single one of them, well, the spirit of the Lord's coming upon them in order for them to go and do that job and bring the deliverance. Whether it be physical battles or the spiritual battles, which are represented by these physical battles. Judges 14, verse number 5, the Bible says, Then went Samson down and his father and his mother to Timnath and came to the vineyards of Timnath. And behold, a young lion roared against him, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he rent him as he would have rent a kid, and he had nothing in his hand, but he told not his father or his mother what he had done. So here we do see someone that had got great strength as a result of the Spirit of the Lord coming upon him mightily to be able to just destroy this lion with his bare hands. Now, there's a purpose to all of this, and I don't want to, we already went through the Judges series as a church, so if you weren't here for that, that was like, I think, one of the first books of the Bible that we went through as a church, 
Go back and, and listen to the preaching on that. But um, God is using Samson to basically pick a fight with the Philistines in order to give them deliverance from their oppressors, the Philistines. And, and it's, kind of, it's a kind of cool way it happens, but there's all this chain of events that's being used to bring forth this battle then against the Philistines for, for Samson to be able to destroy a huge number of the Philistines and just devastate their, their power. Verse number 18, jump down to verse number 18 there in chapter 14. And the men of the city said unto him on the seventh day before the sun went down, what is sweeter than honey? And this is the answer to the riddle, basically, that, that, that he was using from the Spirit of the Lord coming upon him in verse 6 when he killed that lion and there was a, a bee's nest that had been made inside the, the corpse and he made this riddle and basically they answered this riddle because they were, um, they got the answer from his wife and then verse number 19 says, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon him and he went down to Ashkelon and slew 30 men of them and took their spoil and gave change of garments unto them which expounded the riddle and his anger was kindled and he went up to his father's house. So that's interesting then in order to, to pay off that debt, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. And again, I'm not going to get into all the details on this, but just understand that overall and flip over to chapter 15, overall this is being used to bring the deliverance from the Philistines. That's, that's what all, all of these problems and all of these things uh, are coming up as conflict points to, to kick off a, a greater victory over the Philistines. That, that's the best way of sum, summing it up in, in not as much detail. Chapter 15, verse number 14, the Bible reads, And when he came unto Lehi, the Philistines shouted against him, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and the cords that were upon his arms became as flax that was burnt with fire, and his bands loosed from off his hands. And, and I love this symbolic reference here, that when the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, it brings him freedom. It brings him the strength to overcome the bondage, to be freed from these bands that are loose and the cords that are broken. And when the Spirit of God comes upon him, boom, there comes freedom. Flip over to 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse number 9. So a lot of what we see in the judges, the Spirit of the Lord coming upon people, preparing them for the day of battle, giving them what they need to go into battle, to, to, to win these fights, which can be applied, well, we apply them spiritually against, you know, our oppressors, against uh, uh, the spiritual wickedness in high places and the battles that we get involved in. And we need the Spirit of God to help guide us and direct us in that path and strengthen us and embolden us. Because those are all things that the Spirit of God is going to do for you. And as I mentioned this morning, you know, hey, we need to be freedom-minded and walk in that liberty of God. Walk in the Spirit of God to bring you that boldness that you need. As I was saying before, hey, God has given you authority and the freedom to do the things he commands you to do without having to worry about what the local laws are or whatever, against, you know, against preaching the gospel, against doing these things. Well, be praying for the Spirit to come upon you so then you can have that boldness and God can can supply the area that, that you might be lacking in to do the job that he has for you to do. 1 Samuel chapter 10, we're going to see Saul here and the Spirit of God coming upon Saul. Verse number 9, the Bible says, And it was so that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart. And all those signs came to pass that day. And when they came thither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. And again, Benjamin was someone, or I mean, excuse me, Saul was someone who, yes, physically his stature was real tall, but when they went to anoint him king, what was he doing? He was hiding among the stuff. He didn't want to be the center of attention. He was meek. He was humble. He, he, didn't, he didn't like being the center of attention. But here we see the Spirit of God coming upon him, another person who just was trying to do his own thing, just living real quiet, living the quiet life, seeking his, his dad's sheep. You know, the sheep have gone astray. He's going to find them, or the asses, or whatever it was that was missing. I forget now if it was asses, I think, that, were, that had run off, and they're, and they're trying to get them. And that's why they ended up, he ended up talking to Samuel. But see, God had already made that divine appointment for that to happen, unbeknownst to Saul. And then God gives him another heart. And then the Spirit of God comes on him, and then he starts prophesying. 
He wasn't a preacher. He wasn't brought up by a preacher. He didn't, all of a sudden, though, God gives him that spirit, so he becomes a preacher. Verse number 11 says, And it came to pass when all that knew him before time saw that, behold, he prophesied among the prophets. Then the people said one to another, What is this that has come unto the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? This is what God can do for you and God's spirit can do for you. Maybe, you know, people that you knew in the past will say, I know him. Who, wait, who's this guy? He was always real quiet. I know Brother Hero. He was real quiet. He didn't really say very much. I knew him growing up. I knew him in school. He didn't really say much of anything. And now here he is, and he's getting behind a pulpit, and he's thundering out, and he's just screaming and pounding and stamping and preaching. Who is this guy? Is he also among the prophets? That's what God can do. That's what God can do. And that's what it was with Saul. They're looking at Saul going like, we know this guy. We knew how he grew up. And now all of a sudden he's out here preaching and prophesying. God's spirit will do that. Don't limit the spirit of God. He can use you the way that he wants. Just be open for it. Maybe he doesn't want you to, do, to, to be in a capacity like he was giving for you know, King Saul to be, to be anointed that, that first king of Israel. There was a lot of men around at that time, and he chose Saul for that job. But you know what? Saul was ready, and he chose him for a reason. You be ready. You don't know where God is going to necessarily want to have you and, and where the best place is going to be for you. Be ready for that, and just understand, with God's spirit, he can change you into what you need to be. And we should be seeking that. Flip over chapter 11. We're in chapter 10. Just go to chapter 11, verse number 6. Thus, and the Spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard those tidings. Now, we heard these tidings. There were these people in Israel who were basically told, like, uh, and, uh, what country? Who was that? The, uh, was it the Ammonites that were coming to him saying, you know, hey, you know, you surrender to us, and we're going to make you pluck out your eye, right? And then you're going to be our servants. And they're like, well, hold on a minute. <laughs> Let's see if there's anyone that's going to protect us, if anyone's going to stand up for us. And if not, then okay, we'll, we'll, we'll do what you say. We'll be your servants. We don't want to die. So we'll, we'll pluck out our eyes and we'll become your servants. So they send out this message, right? And Saul hears about this and, he's, and it makes him angry. It says, the spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard his tidings and his anger was kindled greatly. And I just, the reason why I like pointing this out is because people just want to say that all anger, no matter what, is just ungodly or not of God. And that is false. That is false as evidenced by this verse right here. Now, you ought not to just be known as an angry person who's just like, oh, man, Pastor Bruce is just always angry. I mean, you try to talk to him, he's just always angry. And he's just, rah, 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 you know, <laughs> that wouldn't be right. That's, that's, that is ungodly. That is not a good attribute. You shouldn't have that characteristic. But there are times that you should have righteous indignation. There are things that should happen that you can hear, and it's godly to have a response of being angry. When Jesus walked into the temple and he saw people buying and selling in the temple in God's house, he got angry. He made a whip, and he flipped over the tables, and he drove everybody out. Is Jesus a sinner? No. But he had righteous indignation because there was a time he, he came upon these people who were doing things that ought not to be done in the house of God. And it made him angry, and he dealt with it. Saul hears, what in the world is wrong with these people? Why would they even consider this? It made him angry and said, no, I can't believe that you would even question whether or not your brethren, your people are going to come to your aid and support you. Of course we're going to support you. We'll be right there. It made him angry. And he said, look. Everyone, he says here in verse number seven, he took a yoke of oxen and hewed them in pieces and sent them throughout all the coasts of Israel by the hands of messengers, saying, Whosoever cometh not forth after Saul and after Samuel, so shall it be done unto his oxen. And the fear of the Lord fell on the people, and they came out with one consent. He said, This is what's going to happen if you don't join us. You better get your rear ends out here right now and help us support our brethren. It made him angry that people weren't already supporting him. And, of course, God brings the victory. And that was the Spirit of God coming upon him to go forward and fight that battle. Flip over to chapter 16, 1 Samuel chapter 16. Now we're going to see this. Uh, we're almost done the Old Testament reference. We're going to go to the New Testament. 
try to hurry up a little bit. For Samuel 16, chapter 12, or excuse me, chapter 16, verse number 12. By reason he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and with all a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. So we, here we see David being anointed as the next king, as appointed by God to be that king. And it says that the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day and forward. So the Spirit of God, and we're going to see this, the Spirit, look at verse number 14. And the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. And it's not because the Spirit of the Lord could only be on one person at a time. We saw with Moses that, no, he took that spirit and put it on 70 people. God can put his spirit on as many people as he wants to. But know this, too, that when God is in doing someone with power and putting a spirit on them, it's not, that's also not a permanent thing either. If you're not walking the way he wants you to walk, that spirit can depart from you. Now, it's not every single sin or infraction that God just going, boom, okay, I'm taking the spirit away from you. Otherwise, I mean, no one would have it then. God has grace and gives us space to be able to work with us. I mean, we need to have that. But there are, there is a line where God, where God just saying, no, you can't cross this line. And for some people, you might think it's a great sin, a grievous sin, but it depends on how you view things, if you view things like God does. Because for Saul, it, it, for some people, you might think it wasn't much. But for God, it absolutely was much. For him just, you know, taking upon himself to offer a sacrifice, God's like, no, 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 you've, you've overstepped your bounds. You cannot do that. That was for Samuel to do, not for you. And, and, and I, I don't want to get into all that, but the point is here, and what I really want to stress here is that the Spirit of God could come upon people, it could also be removed from people. And this has nothing to do with your salvation. When the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, it doesn't mean that now Saul's unsaved. Because nobody was indwelled with the Spirit of God at this time, and definitely not everybody had the Spirit of God resting on them. Absolutely not. Very few people. For Moses, it was you know, him and then these 70 people, and maybe there were some other people that God was ended up using, but, but it was not, definitely by far not the vast majority of people, and those definitely were not the only saved people in the whole camp. No way. And same thing with, with the children of Israel. I mean, these are people in prominent positions, David and Saul, that are being used to be kings. You mean to tell me that they're the only people who were saved? Of course not. That's really, so, so you can't conflate the Spirit of God coming upon someone with salvation. And I'm spending the time going through the Old Testament just to show you how many times we see this. And this isn't even all of them, but how many times we see this. Flip over, if you would, to Matthew chapter 3. Because when we get into the New Testament now, the only thing you have to deal with, there's an addition of the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. But the same concept of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost coming upon people, continues from the Old Testament, unbroken into the New Testament. That that same way that God deals with pouring out His Spirit continues to happen in the New Testament. And just because it happens in the New Testament doesn't mean it's any different than it was in the Old Testament, Right? But you have too many religions and other people teaching only from a New Testament perspective and trying to say that it's something it's not and tie it in with salvation where it's not tied in with salvation. Not in this instance, not, not in these types of things, not with God giving you the power to do these things with the Holy Spirit coming upon you. Matthew chapter 3. Verse number 11, the Bible reads, I indeed baptize you with water, this is John the Baptist, under repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Now, I just want to point this out, that when the Bible says he's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost, Baptism, and the word baptize, literally means immerse. There's immersion. 
think about what happens when we baptize people we dunk them completely under the water and bring them back up that is a baptism because you're completely immersed and surrounded by water so when he says that Jesus there's one coming after me which is Jesus who's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost what he's saying is that you are going to be immersed you know God's Holy Spirit is going to come upon you so mightily that you are going to be engulfed and surrounded and baptized in this Holy Ghost it's not referring to the dwelling of the Holy Spirit that's going to live inside of you for believers that's not what he's talking about here he's talking about the disciples and the followers doing all of these mighty works and mighty acts because they're engulfed and baptized in the Holy Ghost to do those things that's why they were capable of performing all these miracles and the same miracles that Jesus was doing because they were baptized in the Holy Ghost that's how much power the Holy Ghost have upon him to do these mighty works just like Jesus was doing they were going off and healing people they were casting out devils they were doing these mighty things that you can only do under the power of the Holy Spirit so this is what's being prophesied here so if you're wondering well why does it mean what's he talking about being baptized with the Holy Ghost it's because God's gonna pour out his power of this Holy Ghost upon these people that's why that's why they're capable of doing these things but this is not something that follows every single believer in the world and that they're gonna be capable of doing these things this is what the Pentecostals say oh you know I've had people tell me oh you're saved so do you speak in tongues because if you don't speak with tongues then that means you're not saved it's like no that doesn't mean that at all there are plenty of people in the Bible that were saved that didn't speak with other tongues not to mention that what they call speaking in tongues is something totally unbiblical anyways but this concept of being baptized with the Holy Ghost this is not everybody gets baptized in the Holy Ghost And watch out for that too because people are just so many weird doctrines that and these are the types of things because it's not something that's just visible and people are able to take it and run with it and because it, uh, unfortunately this doctrine isn't even really taught that much in the, in the majority of churches so it's kind of like people are just left to their own to just go like I don't know what that means and you hear someone preaching some false doctrine and it's like oh well, maybe that's what that means doesn't quite sound right but who knows it's important to understand these things because then you get some people who will say you know well you got to be baptized to be saved right and then, if that's ridiculous what do you mean you have to be baptized to be saved what about the thief on the cross I was talking to someone hey what about the thief on the cross well yeah he wasn't baptized but he was still saved then they say oh well I mean it, when you get baptized you gotta be baptized in the Holy Ghost then you're saved and then the point you know it's like if people don't even understand what is this even talking about oh okay well maybe maybe everybody's baptized in the Holy Ghost when they get saved no no because even at this time believers weren't indwelled with the Holy Ghost but there were definitely believers and they weren't all doing miracles and they weren't all casting out devils and they weren't all doing these mighty acts that are only done through the power of the Holy Ghost flip over to Luke chapter 1 Luke chapter 1 quite a few references in Luke chapter 1 Luke 1 15 the Bible says for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb so about John the Baptist that doesn't mean he's saved from his mother's womb just all just he's already chosen and he's just preordained to just be saved just no matter what and he's never gonna sin he's never you know but God can pour out his spirit on who he will even Caiaphas being the high priest that year the Bible says prophesied that it was expedient that one should die for the whole nation talking about Jesus he didn't speak that of himself but he spake that the Bible says being the high priest and the Holy Ghost used him to speak the Word of God he wasn't even saved he was an enemy of Christ so this doesn't necessarily have to just be with saved people now obviously the vast majority of the time I think it's gonna be the exception we're gonna find somebody in that regard 
having the Holy Spirit come upon them to say something like that is going to be a rarity. But God definitely uses unsaved people a lot for his will to be accomplished, whether that be through the Holy Ghost or not. But we see here that John the Baptist is going to be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. He's a special person that was going to, to have that power of the Holy Ghost upon him and, and be bold and um, be able to benefit from the Holy Ghost being upon him from his youth. Verse number 35 says, And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. So this is talking about Mary and the, the Immaculate Conception. Uh, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So the Holy Ghost comes upon Mary and gives her the power to be able to conceive that seed from the Holy Ghost to, to, give, to be able to, to carry and give birth to Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Verse number 41 says, And it came to pass when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And look at this. What happened when Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost? And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. So now we're starting to see this consistency with being filled with the Holy Ghost in the New Testament with what we saw in the Old Testament. Speaking, prophesying, speaking out loud, your loud voice, blessed art thou among women. Luke 1 verse 67 says, and his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Ghost. Look at this, and prophesied. So he gets filled with the Holy Ghost, and what does he do? He prophesies, saying, blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up in horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Flip over to chapter 3, Luke chapter 3. And this verse makes it abundantly clear that the Holy Ghost coming upon someone is not a salvation event. It's not something that only happens when somebody gets saved. Of the Holy Ghost coming upon somebody. Because we see that it happens with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ didn't get saved. He didn't get saved when he got baptized. He didn't get baptized because he needed salvation. So people who think that, oh, well, why did Jesus get baptized? He didn't need to be saved. He was without sin. He was showing us the right way, but here's the thing. Did Jesus always just have the Spirit of God upon him? No, he didn't. There was many years of his life that he didn't start his ministry in doing the actual work of the Lord that was set out for him to do in his ministry where he went out and healed people and taught people, did everything else. He, didn't, he wasn't healing people at two years old, at three years old, at four years old, at five years old. He wasn't doing it. He didn't have the Holy Ghost on him in that regard, like he received when he got baptized. Verse number 21, the Bible says, Now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus, also being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Ghost descended in bodily shape like a dove upon him. So at this moment, the Holy Ghost is descending upon Jesus Christ in bodily form and rests upon Jesus Christ. It says, And a voice came from heaven and said, Thou art my beloved son, in thee I am well pleased. Flip over to John chapter 7. Also, I skipped over this point too in Luke 3, where it says that Jesus also being baptized, it said, and praying. Praying you're going to see pop up a few times in the New Testament as well, when in regards to the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost coming upon people. That is another aspect that we do. We, it was in the prayer before the service. It, it normally is in our prayers before the service because we want the Holy Spirit to move in our church services to help us all to learn, to help me to speak, to help you to listen, to help us all to learn and to grow in our faith. We want God's Spirit working in us every time we're gathered together. So we're going to pray for that, and that is very biblical. Jesus Christ himself prayed, being baptized and prayed, hey, heaven's open, now all of a sudden the Spirit of God comes and descends upon him. Now what we're going to see in the book of John, we're going to see a little bit of the differentiation between what we've already seen, New Testament, Old Testament, of the Spirit of God coming upon people and doing them with power, helping them to preach, helping them to fight battles, versus the Holy Spirit of God dwelling inside of you. John 7, verse 38, the Bible says, He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Verse 39 says, But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, 
because that Jesus was not yet glorified. You say, well, wait a minute. What do you mean the Holy Ghost was not yet given? I mean, we saw going back to Luke chapter 1 and Luke chapter 2 and Luke chapter 3, we see the Holy Spirit coming on Mary. We see the Holy Ghost coming on Zechariah. What do you mean the Holy Ghost was not given? Because this is different. Because this comes from within, not from without. The Holy Ghost coming upon somebody is God pouring out that spirit or filling them with the spirit is not the same as it dwelling within you, within your heart, within your spirit that God will give you as a new believer. This is something different, and which is very clear and evident just based on the, the fact that he said it was not yet given. When there's already examples of people having a Holy Ghost come upon them. And then in John chapter 20, we're going to see the actual time when this Holy Ghost is given and people for the first time now are receiving the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. John chapter 20. Because this is after now Jesus is glorified. John 7 said it couldn't have happened because it has to happen after Jesus is glorified. After his resurrection. John chapter 20 happens in verse 21 after the resurrection of Christ. Verse 21, the Bible says, Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Now they've already been operating under the power of the Holy Ghost by casting out devils, by doing these great works, healing, you know, doing all these things with Jesus. This is different. He's actually breathing on them and saying, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Like, right, it's blowing into them that Holy Ghost from God going into them. And it says, whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them, and whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. Now let's look at the events that happen after the giving of the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. We turn to Acts chapter 1. We're going to see the difference again. The indwelling of the Holy Ghost isn't referenced nearly as much in the scripture, like the information about the benefits of that, as the power of the Holy Ghost coming upon people. That is more evident. Now, the Holy Ghost is going to be, that's that comforter that we have, that every believer has. That's what Jesus doesn't leave us comfortless. So he gives us the comforter. It's going to help lead us and guide us into all, into all wisdom and all knowledge. That's what the indwelling of the Holy Ghost is going to give you. But even after he gives them and says, receive ye the Holy Ghost, and now they're indwelled with the Holy Ghost, there still is this same concept and the same event of the Holy Ghost coming upon people. And these same disciples that received that indwelling, that out of their belly shall flow these living waters, this Holy Ghost that's within them, now are instructed to wait for the Holy Ghost to come upon them. After this event in John 20 of meeting with Jesus Christ, he says, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Look at Acts chapter 1, verse number 4. The Bible reads, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. I thought you already gave them the Holy Ghost. He did. That was the indwelling. This is different. This is a different event. This is something separate. This is that baptism of the Holy Ghost that not every believer gets. Every believer gets that Holy Ghost that indwells, the, that indwells you. This is something different. This is something that was preparing them that they needed for the day of Pentecost to be able to preach the word of God mightily and reach people from all over the world and gave them the ability to preach to people of other languages and other nations and communicate with them when they couldn't naturally do it themselves. God wanted the gospel to be spread into all the world and he gave them the ability to do it through his spirit. And they needed to be engulfed with the Holy Spirit because they needed a lot of extra tools at their disposal, like being able to communicate with people that they had no idea what the language was. It makes perfect sense. Don't let people try to trip you up and twist the scripture on you to, to conflate these two 
and be careful when you're reading just to make sure you're, you know, you're seeing, oh, okay, well, this is what this means. And it's consistent. When you see the same thing happening, it's consistent throughout the Bible. That's what it's talking about. Verse 6 says, when, you, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said unto them, it's not for you to know the times of the seasons, which the Father hath put in his own power. But look at this, verse number 8. But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Not dwelling within you is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses. So what are they going to do when the Holy Ghost comes upon them? Be witnesses. Go out and speak. Go out and preach unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and under the uttermost parts of the earth. That's what their job is. I'm going to give you the Holy Ghost. Wait. The Holy Ghost is going to power you and do you. And then you're going to go forward and you're going to preach. You're going to be witnesses through the power of the Holy Ghost. Flip over to chapter 2. So now they're waiting. They're waiting. They're waiting for the, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, which was promised to them by Jesus Christ. After he'd already blown on them and said, receive you the Holy Ghost. Verse number one, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. Look at this. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. So they're being engulfed by this sound of a rushing mighty wind completely surrounding them. Verse 3, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. Remember what he says, you should be baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire? <laughs> this is what he's talking about. It ought not puzzle you. Very clear. Verse 4, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and what did what? Began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Flip over to chapter 4. This is what we need to, you know, we ought to, be, to want to be filled with the Spirit of God. We ought to pray for that. But understand what that means. Understand what's going to happen when you're filled with the Spirit of God. God's going to use you to fight battles, and God's going to use you to preach His Word. And the two go hand in hand. You're not gonna be fight, he's not, he's not going to be using you to fight physical battles. Let me just break that for you right now. If you had hopes of gearing up in armor and getting guns and getting bulletproof vests and doing all that, that's not how he's going to use you. That's not our fight. The weapons of our warfare are spiritual. They're not carnal. They're not physical. So you want the Spirit of God coming upon you, just get the... I don't know what the what are what are the modern day shoot shooting games now it's like Rainbow Six or whatever like what what are those games you get the most frags who knows right someone knows out there and you don't want to tell me but <laughs> don't be envisioning that this is what you're going to be you're going to be this great sniper with the most kills because God's going to do you with the Holy Spirit get that out of your mind right now he's going to he's going to make you a spiritual sniper <laughs> through the Word of God through preaching, through speaking, okay? And he's going to help you, and he's going to give you the ability to be able to speak what he wants you to speak. He's going to help you to have the boldness. He's going to help you to do the job that he has for you to do to fight that spiritual battle and to preach and to be witnesses. That's what being filled with the Holy Ghost is going to do with you. Uh, chapter 4, verse number 6, we're almost done. The Bible says, And Annas the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, as many as were of the kindred of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem, and when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? So again, we're seeing them confronted. Right? This happens all throughout the book of Acts. But what, who, who made you, who gave you the authority to do these things? Who do you think you are going around and teaching this stuff? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said, Unto them, ye rulers of the people of uh, ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel. So these are these high up people. But what does God do? God fills them with that Holy Ghost. He gives them the boldness to be able to respond. He gives them that boldness 
He knows he's walking in freedom. He knows God gave him a plan. God filled him with his spirit, and he's going forward saying, hey, I have liberty in Christ. I have freedom to go and preach the gospel, and nobody's going to stop me. And you know what? When God fills him with his spirit, he answers these rulers. He says, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man by what means he has made hold, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel, but by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him that this man stand here before you whole. Talk about not beating around the bush. You know what? When you're filled with the Spirit of God, you're going to be very clear. You're not trying to hide anything. You're not trying to hide the truth under a bushel. You're going to come right out and say it and say, you guys killed him. But he's the same one that, that, that made this man whole. It's by the power of God. You're wicked. This is what happened. It's the power of God. There you go. You're asking us, I'm telling you. I'm not going to hold back. I'm not going to watch my words because God has given me liberty and I'm filled with the Spirit of God and I'm going to preach the Word of God. And that's what we need. We need more of the Holy Spirit of God coming upon us. And I love this if you jump down a little bit. We'll just keep reading. I mean, it's just such a great passage. Let's just read these verses. Verse 11 says, This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Excuse me. Verse 13, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. They're filled with the Spirit of God. They're unlearned. They're ignorant. They didn't get the proper education. They didn't. So by, by the world's standards, hey, they're not qualified to be these preachers. Who are these people? Well, I can't go out and preach. I wasn't a Pharisee. I didn't go through all these. I didn't get my doctorate of theology. God says, I want to use you. And I'm going to give you what you need. And they spent time with Jesus. They had the word of Jesus. That's what they needed. And God gave them the rest. To the point where these people are just amazed. And you know who gets the credit for that? God. You know where the glory lies? For what Peter did and what Paul did and what James did and what John did and what all these disciples did? They were fishermen. They were publicans. They were, you know, all these various tradesmen. God gets the credit. God gets the glory for what they did. Because God molded them. God shaped them. God formed them. God fashioned them to be used by him. And God just chose people. Hey, here's someone in whom there's no guile found. I want to use that. I like that. I'm going to use you. And God gave Andrew what he needed. And God could give you what you need to. Just be willing. Just be willing. Jump down to verse number 31, chapter 4. Look at what it says in verse 31. And when they had prayed, what is that praying again? When they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they did what? Oh, yeah. They spake the word of God with boldness. Being indwelled with the Holy Ghost is not going to give you the boldness to preach the word of God. That alone, you need the Holy Ghost coming upon you and getting that power from God, praying for that, asking God for that, communicating with God for that, and him pouring out his spirit on you to get that boldness and to be able to just go forward and do everything. And look, he's not going to hold back. Would God that, that all, all of his people were prophets? And God wants that too. We need to be spiritually minded. I had more points, more reference points, but we completely ran out of time. I think, I think it handles the subject pretty well. You, it, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of scripture on this. There's a 
a lot of scripture on this. Don't let people confuse you on the indwelling of the Holy Ghost, what happens when the Holy Ghost comes upon you, and then with all these other nonsense things that you can't even find in scripture being associated with, with the works of God. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for giving us what we need. That um, One, that, that you've even committed unto us such a great job of being an important job of going forward and preaching your word and being lights in a dark world, Lord, but, but not only giving us that job, but, but providing us with the tools that we need to succeed. Lord, thank you for giving us and, and allowing us to be recipients of, of the power of the Holy Ghost coming upon us, dear Lord, and I pray that you would please pour out of your spirit on our church, pour out on all of us here, dear Lord. We want to serve you not just while we're gathered together here, but throughout the week, every day, Lord, help us to maintain that June challenge of, of identifying people to preach the gospel to. Give us that power, Lord. Help us to be mindful of these things. Give us the boldness that we need, and Lord, just help us to, to be your servants, to be your messengers, to, to use your words to make the changes needed in this world, dear Lord, and that that your will would be done. We love you, and we're here for you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.